appreciate the opportunity to be here. Appreciate you being here. And uh, we'll get started. We always have stories, but I'll try not to tell you my uh, escapades. I did fly, you know, and your luggage doesn't always go with you. I found out what priority means, first to be lost. I told the lady, I said, you lost my luggage. She says, oh, no. We, it's delayed. I said, okay. Well, it was lost till you found it a few minutes ago. So I had to make that clear. Uh, let's go ahead and throw it up on the screen. I'll, yep, that's what I want. That's a blank screen. Now, it doesn't look blank anymore because I put those words on there. But I put this on there because I want to make sure I introduce my wife. I frequently forget, but my wife, Judy, is here with me. We are on the last leg of this trip. We'll be going back home on Tuesday. We flew out a while back out to California. I preached out there and then from California preaching in a street preacher's conference in Memphis on uh, up through, what is today, Fr Sunday, Saturday, Friday. Saturday, I don't know when we were here. But we, we preached in the conference, I think through Friday, and then they lost our luggage. The day to lose it is not the day that you have a wedding and lost my wife's luggage. No new clothes, no makeup, and uh, I'll tell you what, I, I am married to the best woman that God could ever have given me. I've said that before, but she proved it again, and here she is. You know what she did? Well, first of all, then we got to Avis. They didn't have our rent-a-car ready, so I had to stand in line. I called him. He said, just jump the line. I said, I'm not going in front of all these people. But they did give me a Dodge Charger, which was how they, you know, paid me back for standing in line and not having my car ready. But it was 2 o'clock in the morning we got to the hotel. No luggage, no change of clothing for my wife. So I didn't change either. Just, I wanted to feel her pain and let her know, look, I'm, I'm there with you, baby. So, uh, you know, she put, a, she put a cushion around her neck, you know, the ones that you wear to keep your, and that kept her makeup on her face and... I'm telling you, I, I was very impressed. We got up early, to morning, early in the morning, got here early. They said it'd be here at 9.30, the luggage. It, got it, it was 5 o'clock, we got it. So it wasn't quite what they promised. And, you know, I'll tell you, I just wonder why the air, airlines are losing money. But this is my beautiful wife, Judy, and uh, we have a new logo on top, Partners for Truth Ministries. I do want to announce this too, kjv1611.com is my daily blog. You can go there, sign up, you won't be spammed. Uh, in fact, you won't even go on my mailing list, you'll just go on that mailing list, which is a daily devotional. It's usually about a paragraph long, starts with a scripture, a paragraph, and then it has some uh, questions, devotional questions, and then some prayer requests, and a song you can sing as a family. We have churches using these, and a lot of families using these devotions, but it's kjv1611.com. If you want to sign up for my daily, uh, my monthly uh, update, if I do them monthly, it's at BibleDoug.com, BibleDoug.com. Uh, this is one book rightly divided. I do want you to pray about this. It's out of print. It sells new right now from 287 to over $400. Used copies sell for 90 to about 300 on Amazon. I'm trying to get it back in print. One of the things I'm going to do is what you'll see this morning. It's going to be one book rightly divided, the prophetic edition. And I'm going to revamp the whole book. I was telling somebody, there, you know, there, there are problems in anything you write, but I had things in mind that I had regurgitated. I'd been taught it, I regurgitated, and I told him, I said, then I read my Bible. And that is a joke, thank you for laughing. Uh, I read my Bible, and, you know, I was getting in there and reading all these writers and stuff, and, you know, I adjusted it some, but I'm going to adjust it this time. It's going to be the prophetic edition. This is part of the transcript or manuscript here. It's about um, 50 more pages just writing on it that's prophecy. I've been asked to preach quite a bit lately on prophecy, not something I ever did before much. In fact, when I taught in Bible college, teaching some of the Old Testament books, I didn't really teach through the prophetic parts of it that much because I wasn't schooled on it. I wasn't, I wasn't into it. Well, then I wrote this book, see if it's up there. Well, no, that's not, 
That's not it. The next one after this. But this is the sword searcher. It has a digital copy of one book rightly divided on it. Changed by the book is a seven DVD set teaching the book. People are asking me, how do I get a copy of rightly divided? That's how you'll get it is through the sword searcher. Uh, I'm probably not going to put it into an e-book. I did that with one book stands alone. It just takes too much time, too much effort to do right now for me. So you can get the one book rightly divided in the Sword Searcher, uh, which I think is one of the best computer programs out there. Now the book that I was mentioning is Will the Church Go Through the Tribulation? That is, um, I wrote a chapter in there and once I wrote that, people read the chapter and then everybody's asking me, oh, what about prophecy? Come t teach us prophecy. I even did a revival. I was, had one scheduled about three weeks ago. I taught it in Sunday school and the pastor asked me to teach it Sunday night, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So um, this is actually a five-part series. You will see parts of the first part uh, this morning called the ABCs of Bible prophecy. I will not get into the prophecy that much other than establishing why Bible prophecy is important, especially during these days that we live in. So the ABCs of Bible prophecy... The Word of God testifies of Jesus, John 5, 39, says, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. That's me doing that, by the way. This little controller here gets a little wild on me. Search the Scriptures, the Bible says, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Isaiah 42, 9 Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. That's Bible prophecy. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So before they ever come to pass, if you look at the Bible, the Bible's a prophetic book. It has a lot of prophecy in it. And the Bible says in Revelation that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. So it's very important to study prophecy. Now the problem is you've got a bunch of nuts studying prophecy, dating the Lord's return and things like that, and 88 reasons why uh, Jesus will come back in 1988, and then of course in 89, it was 89 reasons why he'll come back in 89. Same guy, wise not, you know. He wasn't very wise, because he did the very thing he's not supposed to do. Jesus is the light of the world in John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. You want your lights to come on, it's studying the Bible. It's looking at Jesus, finding out what the Bible says about our Savior. And it's very important to understand that. It repeats it over and over again, John 9, 5. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Of course, Jesus isn't walking on this earth anymore right now. So what do we do? Well, today's sure word of prophecy, we're told about it in 2 Peter 1.17, the Bible says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, the Bible says. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with you in the holy mount. So they heard the actual voice of God. And when they heard that voice, this is what they said. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the, star, uh, the day star rise in your hearts. This is what he's talking about. A more sure word of prophecy. When you look into the Word of God, if you heard a voice from heaven, you compare that to reading the Bible, you better run from the voice and read the Word. Because it's not going to be the same thing that Peter's talking about here. But we have a more sure word of prophecy there in the Bible. Well, when you look at darkness, darkness results from rejecting the light. You reject the Word of God and you go into darkness. John 12, 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in what? In darkness. You'll go into darkness if you don't abide in that light. And that light comes from the Scriptures. So as we study the Word of God, we're going to study it from a prophetic viewpoint. Why teach about the rapture? It's also known as the catching out of the saints, the translation, or the blessed hope. 
Why study about it? Well, never once are Christians told to prepare for the tribulation. Never once are you told to prepare for the tribulation. If we were, if we were going to go through the tribulation, don't you think Paul and his epistles would have given us instructions on how to survive, how to make it through? But you do know that there is a, there is a big movement amongst King James Bible-believing Baptists to say we're going into the tribulation. Huge. In fact, many missionaries now are, you know, when they fill out forms or mention some of their doctrinal positions are leaving the question blank about the church and whether it's going into the tribulation or not. There's a guy out in uh, Arizona who has put out a video, and the video is very, very well done. He's a King James Bible believer, and he says we're going into the tribulation because he applies Matthew 24 to the church, to the church, and it's a real problem. Number two, why are Christians today increasingly questioning this fundamental eschatology? Well, I believe 2 Timothy 3.1 sort of tells us, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. I believe we're living in perilous times. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. And then in verse 7 it says, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I believe we have a generation today ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. The only way you will find truth is through the scriptures. The only way you will know what God wants you to know is through the scriptures. And if you ignore the scriptures, you will stay in darkness. If you doubt the scriptures, you will never have the light that God intends for us to have as Christians. That light comes from scripture. And if you don't get into the book, then you'll stay in darkness. I want to be a Bible student. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're to be workmen. Workmen. What does that mean? Well, that means work in your Bible study. I mean, you say, well, I read my Bible. You ought to study your Bible too. You ought to read it. You ought to study it. And you ought to make sure that you get down on your face before God. And I really believe that sometimes prayer, you need to be down on your knees. I mean, I pray when I'm driving. I, when I wake up in the morning, one of the first things I do is pray. Before I get out of bed, I'm praying. I wake up in the middle of the night, I try to pray. I'll tell you why. One of the other, you know, it's practical too. The devil lets you go back to sleep. But I pray. Sometimes I'll pray for a missionary across, you know, across the sea. Man, it's daytime for him. And the devil just lets you go. Resist the devil. He'll flee from you, man. You start praying. He'll let you go. So here's what the third question is. How do you avoid falling prey to false doctrines trying to refute uh, the pre-tribulation rapture? Well, I believe there's a three-pronged approach to interpreting prophecy. Number one, you distinguish between Israel and the church. If you fail to distinguish between Israel and the church, then you will be like this guy that's putting out this video saying we're going into the tribulation because it talks about clouds and catching up and he, he misjudges what's going to happen to us in our last days and what's going to happen to Israel in their last days. So you end up having a, period, a, a thing where he doesn't distinguish between Israel and the church. Number two, understand the timing of the events of the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel. Understand those things. Listen, those are not hard things to understand. If you study those books and you, you, know, you get into the book and you study it yourself, you'll find out, listen, those are not as hard as they seem. And then number three, grasp the promised restoration of the nation of Israel. I believe Israel will be restored. I believe they are broken off. We are grafted in as a wild olive branch. But one day, God is going to again deal with that nation of Israel. And to say that he's not means that the two witnesses aren't the two witnesses. The 144,000 aren't 12,000 each of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel, you know, with some exception, Dan and all that. But um, it's Israel, Israel, Israel in the tribulation. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. I am not Jacob. I am not Israel. And so when you look at those things and you consider them, don't take those promises and apply them to the church. Don't usurp where you're not supposed to be usurping. Our 
Our vision, our hope is that the rapture is going to happen. Some people say, well, you're just an escapist. You're, you, you believe in the rapture, so you just sit back and do nothing. Well, I'm telling you, I, I'm not sitting back. Um, I'll be home, we fly home Tuesday, and, on, and the following Tuesday I fly to the Philippines. I'll be in the Philippines for two weeks. I'll be home for a week after that, and then it's, I, I'll actually be back here to your conference and preaching in Cincinnati before I get here, from here to Michigan, up in Michigan for a couple of weeks, back home. Um, look, I, I'm not sitting back because I'm just waiting for the rapture. No, the Bible says you ought to be waiting Watching, and guess what else? Working. Working. Ephesians 2, 2, 8 and 9. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created unto, in, unto good works, the Bible says in verse 10. We're created to work. The reason we're left here is to work. Not sit back and say, well, you know, the rapture could happen, so I just need to wait, you know, and do nothing. That's not what the waiting's all about. The waiting's a hope. The waiting's knowing that, listen, he's going to call his ambassadors home, unlike some countries would do before you do all-out war. You know, you just leave your ambassadors behind. But we're ambassadors for Christ. What's God going to do with his ambassadors? He's going to call us home before he says, hey, war on earth. So number four, what are the origins of the teaching concerning the rapture? Well, Bible critics claim that it's either John Nelson Darby or C.I. Schofield. They say, well, those are the guys that, that did this thing. Well, I personally believe that it isn't those two. I look at the Scripture. What's the Scripture say about this thing? Well, in Ephesians 3.10, it says, To the intent that now in the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. I believe the church reveals uh, the truth. I believe that when we go to the scripture, that revelation is given to the world. And I also believe in a thing called progressive illumination, sort of coined by, uh, by us. I used to say progressive revelation, but I really don't want to sound like the charismatic. I don't believe you have additional revelation today, but I believe you have illumination of the revelation that's already given. It's already in the book, but you may not see it. You say, what is progressive revelation? Well, here's an example of progressive revelation. In Revelation 13, 16, it says, He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Well, 200 years ago, they wouldn't have said, well, that's probably a computer chip. Why wouldn't they say that? Well, because I got my first computer when they came out, and that wasn't that long ago. You know, they didn't have computer chips and computers 200 years ago. So why do we think it's a, you know, something like an RFID chip? And it could be. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. We don't know. But the Bible prophesies that it'll be in their hands. Now, all the modern versions change this to on, on, on. It is on your forehead, but it's also in your forehead, and it's also in your right hand in the King James Bible. So it'll be something like maybe like an RFID chip. Now, I told people, I said, look, now these are the post-tribbers. I said, that is not the mark of the beast right there. And that's all they heard. And I said, because that picture right there shows somebody getting it in the left hand. And, and I didn't explain this, but I had to explain it to somebody that saw the video when it came out from Orlando in a, in a prophecy conference. And they, you know, oh. Stoffer says this isn't the RFID chips, not the, not the mark of the beast. I said, no, I believe it very well may be, but that picture right there is not somebody taking the mark. Number one, it's in the left hand. Number two, what's the stipulation? You got to worship the beast. That's the other, if, some, if you take a computer chip today, you're not going to hell and losing your salvation. In fact, I had a guy come up to me and tell me, he says, I work for so and so, and they had us put it, you know, we have a chip. I said, you're kidding. He said, no. I said, well, I, you know, I put one in my dog, but I'm not going to take, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to take it. My goodness, I'm already tracked enough with GPS and phones and computers and, you know, I mean, if they want to know where I am, they don't have to, you know, they don't even have to ask my wife anymore. <laughs> they know where we are, but I don't believe you're taking the mark if you get a chip in you today. Number one, you ha I mean, number two, you have to worship the beast. 
And the post-tribbers want to say, well, that's what they're doing. No, they're not. The beast isn't some computer in Washington, D.C. No writer for the first 5,900 years ever wrote of social security numbers or brain scans or biometrics or computer chips or RFID chips. Now, the RFID just simply means radio frequency identification. And if you look at it, you remember what happened with Target? They stole all those computers. Oh, by the way, I mean, uh, computer uh, credit card numbers. Somebody stole mine. I got a $60 charge in on, my on my credit card, one that we don't use. It's a 0% card, about come and do, and I use it to fund my, my books. I'll get a 0% for, you know, 12 months. And so a $60 charge came through. I said, what is this? So I called them up, and they said it was a government charge. I, now, you know, don't, don't go conspiracy on me. It was a government charge. So I waited till Monday, and I called them up. I said, what's this? And they said, well... Uh, it was, it, well, how much was it? I said, $60. He said, oh, that's filing for a fictitious name. Now I'm like, wow, what is that? So I said, well, what is that? You know, and he said, well, it's this. And he gave me the name and he said, as the undersigned. You know, so it was as the undersigned, this guy's name. And I said, well, I didn't pay for that. And I said, but that's my credit card that they used. I said, can I have the information? He says, well, it's public record. I said, well, can you send it to me by email? And he says, yeah. So he sent me, and I got the guy's name that used my credit card, his address in Palm Beach, Florida, but he lives in um, right near Memphis, where I was uh, this past week. So we got to file a police report and file this thing, but he got my credit card number somehow. But what are they doing? I believe a lot of this is being set up. Like Target, I mean, hey, you need to, we need to do something about these credit cards. We need, to, we need to start working toward this chip. And I believe it's setting it all up, but I thought it was interesting. Now, the guy next to me in Orlando, he got a phone call, and somebody had taken out a $10,000 loan in his name. I said, you're kidding. And then the week after, I come back, and I've got our credit card uh, number stolen amazing things. But what they're going to do is you're going to see more of this. And I think some of it's set up. I mean, who are the guys probably putting out all the viruses? <laughs> you know, McAfee, <laughs> Norton. Oh, no, they're the ones that fix it. <laughs> I mean, think about it. You, you know, if you really want to make a business today, it's not, and there's no ethics. You just do whatever it takes. Cashless societies, they didn't write about that. They didn't write about Vera chips. Now they may have pro prophesied, you know, indirectly, but they didn't write about those specific things. How much surveillance cameras or satellites or drones? I believe the likely end time scenario is a high altitude nuclear electromagnetic pulse, a hemp device. I mean, Israel's going to flee to the mountains. How do you keep somebody safe? You can just put a nuke over there, wipe all Israel out, unless the nukes don't work anymore. And then if that happens and there is a hemp device that's set off, man, that'll be a return to swords and horses and maybe guillotines. You know, think about it. I mean, I think that's what the prophecy might show. Are guillotines foretold? Or this might just be the Muslims, the way they kill people. Revelation 20, verse 4, I saw thrones and they uh, sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads. Remember I told you it's also in and upon. Or in their hands. It's always in the hand. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So when you see this thing, they're beheaded. Why? Well, probably be maybe because a hemp device... You know, they've got to, you know, they've got to go back to things that don't use mechanical equipment. Progressive illumination explains why preceding generations did not focus on the end times events like the current generation. When you have progressive uh, illumination like Daniel 12, 8, and I heard but I understood not, then said I, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And... Um, Verse 9, he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. The words for Daniel are closed up. They're sealed. He didn't get to know what it meant. Can you imagine being a prophet like that and getting up and preaching and you have no clue what you just said? Like a lot of us preachers today anyway. I made a mistake in Memphis. I said something about the Jews and I said, you know, 
uh, it, you know, it's time sensitive. I was talking about, you know, to the Jew first. And I, I guess I was talking so fast. Nobody amen. I said, amen. They were like silence. I was like, I said, you don't agree with that? And some guy over here says, no. <laughs> I was like, I, 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 I. I talked to him later on. He says, I have no idea what you were even asking. I said, you have got to be kidding me. I've got to slow down. 1 Peter 1.10, Peter, what does he talk about? Progressive illumination of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in then did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister. Uh, Brother Sal, yesterday at, after the wedding we were talking and he just mentioned this verse about preservation. This is inspiration which always has preservation. It also proves preservation here. But prophetically what it is is, look, they weren't, they weren't preaching for their generation. Their generation sitting there going, you know, like many people in churches today. <laughs> what are you talking about? That's progressive illumination. The Old Testament saint was left with not knowing what we can know today. They did not hear or see. Isaiah 64, 4, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither have the eyes seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. That's Isaiah 64, 4. Men have not heard nor perceived, neither have the eyes seen, what? What God has prepared for him that waiteth for him. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. By the way, notice that who waiteth for him. That's an interesting thing there. But Paul confirms this progressive illumination in 1 Corinthians. What does he say? But we speak the wisdom of God in the mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse 9. But as it is written, Isaiah 64, 4, where they didn't see and didn't hear, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love, that love him. But look at verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit, the Bible says. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So he says, look, Isaiah 64, they didn't get to see it. But 1 Corinthians, when Paul is writing, he says, he's quoting back there, quoting them, saying they didn't get to see it, but God hath revealed unto us by his Spirit those things. So we do get to see some things that are progressively illuminated. Listen, all the illumination wasn't done when those prophets spoke back in the Old Testament. That's the key to understand prophecy, is they didn't always understand. Jesus promised that the Spirit of truth would reveal prophecy. What does he say? John 16, 13, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Well, that's prophecy. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And all things that the Father hath are mine. Therefore said I that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. He'll show it unto you. Over and over again, we're told that the Spirit of Christ that lives in us will show us things. He will reveal things. He will guide us into all truth. Now, that's exciting, really. You know why you get into error? Oh, it's God's fault. Not according to that verse. You know why I'm, I go into error and I preach things I shouldn't preach or I teach things I shouldn't teach? Because I didn't go to God to find out the answer. Usually it's because you go to man to find the answer. Now, God uses man. Don't get me wrong. For by the foolishness of preaching, God you know, chooses to save them that believe. It's preaching that is the instrument that God uses most. But that doesn't mean that everything you hear is right. You know, how you, you know what your responsibility is? You open up the scriptures and look for yourself. You find out what it says. I better not lose any notes. That one's okay, though. You better check it out. Check out what the Bible says. Because if you don't check it out, 
you may go down the wrong path. You see some guy on the internet and he's giving you some wild-eyed doctrine. You go, oh man, that's new, that's good. Be careful. You'll be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine because you didn't check it out with God. And you check it out with God in the book. And listen, he'll guide you in all truth. The problem's never with a book. The problem is never with a spirit that lives within us. The problem's with us. Because, hey, we've got an agenda. We have, we have a motive that's not of God sometimes. Be careful. Be careful. The four primary teachings concerning the timing of the rapture of the church age believers are these. Pre-tribulation rapture, mid-trib, pre-wrath, post-trib. And I've studied some of the things, you know, did half the tribulation already go by and all that. And, um, you know, I won't comment on that at this point. But there's a seven-year tribulation, seven years of tribulation, the Bible says. We believe, if you're a pre-tribulation, pre-millennial Bible believer, you believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. We'll be raptured out before the tribulation starts, and we'll come back after it ends. But the mid-tribulation sort of in the middle, and then they come back at the end. The pre-wrath is sometimes a little later than the middle and come back in the end. The post-trib, they just jump up and back real quick. <laughs> I don't mean to be light on that, but I guess I do. We believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. We're going to be caught up, and then we're going to come back after the tribulation. And again, time of Jacob's trouble. It's not us. Daniel's 70th week, reconciliation of all things. I thought we are already reconciled in Christ Jesus. So, you know, and, and really... You know, there's going to be the everlasting gospel. Angels going to be flying through heaven preaching. When do I change my message back to the kingdom of, you know, the gospel of the kingdom? It's a real problem if you don't understand. You cannot go through the tribulation. And then you can't go through part of it because then that messes everything up because then it's not the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the church's trouble. He's going to call his ambassadors home before the trouble starts. The post-tribulation rapture dilemma, and usually I spend a little bit more time on this, but I cut some of the slides out last night. Since Christ destroys all unbelievers at his second coming before the millennium, if the rapture took place at the end of the tribulation, then you wouldn't have anybody left with natural bodies to populate the earth during the 1,000-year reign of Christ. So if, the, if he comes back you know, and destroys all, Everybody, but the rapture happens at the end of the tribulation. He takes all the believers out, destroys all the unbelievers. Nobody left on earth. Populate the millennium. That's one big problem, but that's all we'll deal with. Some scriptural pre-tribulation rapture pictures and types, and I have quite a few of these. We'll go through just just a few. Enoch and Noah. Now, you know, if you've been taught different, that's fine. I'll I'll just show you what the truth is, and you can change your teaching. No, you can you can keep whatever. You know, it's just. You know, pictures and types are just that. They're pictures and types. I found out from my charts in my book that a picture is worth a thousand words, and the writer doesn't always determine what thousand words the reader's going to get. <laughs> Got it? Yeah. When you put a line like that and you say the church age, you know, church age, well, that means you're saying it starts here and ends here. No, no, no. I, I really mean it to be a squiggly line. <laughs> you know, it sort of, sort of can go, you know, it can start a little bit before that line shows up. It's tough. So I, I, I'll probably be taking all the charts out of my book, too, just because it does that. When you put a chart out, that chart's a, that chart's a line. That means you're starting a church right here. Just so you know, I believe in Luke 24, he revealed the gospel to those apostles, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. They didn't understand in Luke 18. It was hid from them. Paul said our gospel, if it be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. you got a problem. If, they're, if it's hid from the apostles in Luke 18... And he doesn't reveal it until Luke 24. When are they saved? Or you better rightly divide your Bible. You can't take what Paul says and apply it back to those apostles anymore. You can apply everything in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John forward to the church. So that's why you've got to rightly divide your Bible. Well, when you look at this thing, I believe that the church you know, was empowered at Pentecost. I believe that it was, it was definitely started before Pentecost. Um, or not necessarily before Pentecost, but in Luke 24, that revelation is made very clear to those apostles. Uh, and Jesus said, I will build my church. It didn't start before the death of the testator. And that's about as far as I'll go in a prophecy time. 
Genesis 5, 22, Enoch walked with God. Let's look at Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Twice are we told that Enoch walked with God. Genesis 5, 22, Genesis 5, 24. We're also told Genesis 6, 9 that Noah walked with God, sort of linking the two together. Well, I believe this when you look at it. When you look at Genesis chapter 6, it records God's wrath heating up as men began to multiply on the earth in Genesis 6, 1. The Lord states that His Spirit would not always strive with man, Genesis 6, 3. It is no coincidence that God chose chapter 6 to reveal His, reveal His worldwide judgment. He chose that chapter. The Bible says that the number of the beast is the number of man, Revelation 13, 8. And of course, 18 is 3 times 6. you got 13 is the number of rebellion. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 600, three score and six, or 666. So you have all these sixes going on. You've got, you've got the picture of Enoch and Noah. Some people ask me, well, how important is a picture? Well, let me ask you. When, when uh, Moses struck the rock twice, how important is a picture? He didn't get to go in the promised land. Why? He'd already struck the rock once. He was told to speak to the rock the second time. He struck it twice. And here's another point for you. What came out of the rock? Water. So just because the ends turn out right doesn't mean that the means that got you the ends are justified when your means are wrong. So be careful of that. Just You see, well, the water came out. I must be okay. No, he didn't get to go in the promised land. Why? He destroyed a picture. Pictures are pretty important to God. So let's look at something about this. The number of man is six. The word man shows up six times in Genesis chapter 6 in those verses discussing man's rebellion and God's judgment to come 120 years later. Mo, uh, Noah preached for 120 years. He was a preacher of righteousness, the Bible says in 2 Peter 2.5. So now let's look at this picture. Let's look at this picture. Enoch's a type of the church. The horrors of the flood are yet on the horizon, over the horizon, when he's caught up into heaven without dying. He never dies. The Bible actually says he's translated, which I think is a great word. People say, well, rapture's not in the Bible. Yes, but translation is. You know what's going to happen to us if we're alive when he comes back? We're going to be translated. What about the lost? They're resurrected. We're translated, or I like to say, we're raptured. Noah, he's a type of the sealed tribulation saint. He went through God's worldwide judgment supernaturally protected. So Noah's more of a tribulation saint. Now I know people say, well, he's more of a, you know, he's more a picture of the rapture. I don't think so. I don't think so. And here's why. Noah's reward is he's still on earth on the other side of the flood. He pictures those who survive or endure to the end through the tribulation. So that's why I would say he's that picture. But Enoch, he's still in heaven after the worldwide judgment, picturing the church, the heavenly people. So that's why I would say that Enoch is a picture of us, and then Noah is a picture of that tribulation saint going through the tribulation, and we're not going through the tribulation. Enoch prophesied of Christ's second coming, Jude 14. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand, thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all their ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. It's interesting that that emphasis is there and you do see it, right? It's sort of ungodly. Jude 14. Zechariah 14, 1, it's fulfilled. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoils shall be divided in the midst of thee. Verse 5, and ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, and it continues, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So there it's fulfilled. Revelation 19, 13 is the fulfillment. He was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And that's the second coming. That's where he's going to destroy things. Notice the revelation, that revelation says that the armies, plural, saints from every age and dispensation, at this return Christ comes with his saints, not for his saints like at the rapture. We come with him, he doesn't come for us at that time. Hebrews 11.5, what about Enoch? By faith Enoch was what? Translated. So people don't like the word raptured, just talk to them about the translation of Enoch. 
that he should not see death. Well, isn't that what the rapture is? Sure. And was not found. Why was he not found? Because people were looking for him. What's the rapture going to be like? Well, there are going to be people looking for us. Because God had translated him, for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Some people say, well, the rapture can't be so. It's just escapism. I teach that, look, the church isn't going to become more effective, and then God says, oh, you've done such a great job, time to bring you home. I believe that we're going to become more and more ineffective. If you look around, people are falling by the wayside, by the droves. Why? Well, they're getting tired. Be not weary and well-doing, the Bible says. Don't quit. You know what I want to be in these last days? I want to be busier and busier and busier and busier. I don't want to sit back and say, well, you know, I, I, I've written nine books. I'm done. I'm writing four more right now as we speak. Four more. I got up this morning I was writing. I went to bed last night and, you know, stayed up until I could stay up no more, and I was writing. And I don't like to write that much. It's very, very, very difficult for me to write. I rewrite my stuff 30 times. It sometimes takes me two days to write one paragraph, in the devotional book especially. Two days. I'll go over it and over it and over it. This section I'm working now, I'm working, I work the five paragraphs for the five study days, and it'll take me, it'll take me two, three, four days just to write those five paragraphs. It's grueling. I hate it at times, but it's something God's called me to do. I want to make this point. Look, he pleased God. Do you know in God's eyes, he sees us through Christ. And when you look at Lot, what does it say about Lot? That just man. Did Lot seem like a just man to you? Well, in the eyes of God after the cross, he's a what? He's a just man. And he was called out of, called out of Sodom. Not because of his righteousness. I mean, he couldn't even save his whole family. He couldn't even, I mean, he couldn't even get them believing. But God said, hey, I'll do it. I'll do it for ten. There weren't even ten. Abraham said, there got to be ten. Lot's down there. Oh. Verse 6, but without faith is it impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith it's impossible to please him. Matthew 24, 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as it is in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. That's why I don't believe Noah pictures our rapture. In Matthew 24, he pictures that tribulation saint. He says, don't look back. Why? That judgment's coming quick. And the day Noah got in there, that happened. What happened with Lot? The angels came, grabbed them by the hands, and pulled them out. And then that same day, that fire fell. Listen, that's why you got to be careful, because you go to Matthew 24, and you, you say, well, Noah's a picture of our rapture. Well, then the judgment's coming the day we raptured out. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. Matthew 24, 39, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Did not know it, the day that he closed that door on the ark, the flood started. If you're not careful and you start applying that picture of Noah, then you're going to get yourself in trouble. Enoch died 69 years prior to the birth of Noah and 669 years prior to the flood. Long before it happened. That's just like a picture of us. We're out of here before it happens. With the obvious typology, this fact should confound the pre-wrath post-tribbers since Enoch, a type of the church, was in heaven for all of Noah's existence on this earth. That's why I believe Noah's that picture. Joshua is another one. Now, I, I think I may have taught this in a little bit different way during the King James conference that we had here. Do the chapter, but I'm going to go ahead and go over it from a prophetic standpoint. Due to the chapter and verse divisions, Joshua 6.6 6 is the first time numerically that the mark of the beast appears in Scripture. It's the sixth book, sixth chapter, sixth verse. So you see the pictorially the 666. And that's why uh, in picture and type you have 666, six book, six chapter, six verse. And it's important to see this because the picture you're going to get. Joshua 6.6 6 is that verse. And Joshua the son of Nun called the priests, sent unto them, take up the ark of the covenant, let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. 
So in numerically, you see that. Now let's jump back to 1 Thessalonians 4. Let me build a foundation before we go back to Joshua. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I like to read Revelation when I'm out traveling. I'll say, you know, God rained this down and the earthquake and it killed them. And I go, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. <laughs> you know, it's like, come on. One time I did that and I was speaking so fast they didn't get it that I was not, it wasn't really in Scripture, I think. Everybody stood there, everybody sat there and I went, uh, I was reading from Thessalonians and applying it to Revelation. It doesn't fit. So you got the shout, the trumpet, and caught up. Let's go back to Joshua. Let's see if we can see the picture. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast. Now look, we're in verse 5 before the 666 shows up. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout. And the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall what? Ascend up every man straight before him. So before the sixth verse, sixth chapter of the sixth book of the Old Testament shows up, the 666 in picture form, God said, well, you know what? I'm going to show you a picture of the rapture for a pre-tribulation rapture type. So you can see that. And I think that even, you know, when, when you look at it, and I, I'm going to go ahead and throw this in there. I'll go to verse 6 here in a second. The trumpet in Joshua chapter 6 to the trumpet in Thessalonians, the shout to the shout, the people shall ascend up to Christians caught up. Can you imagine if that were to happen today? It's the last trump. Maybe a long trumpet sound that goes on, and then all of a sudden it just, it's the last one, and it stops. I'm ready. Look at verse 6 now. Remember, we looked at verse 5. What was that? That was the three things of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Well, in verse 6, Joshua the son of Nun called the priest, said unto them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. Where do you find the seven trumpets? Well, in Revelation, where do you find the trumpets? In the 666 pictorially. But verse 5 shows a picture of the rapture. Now look, it's just a picture. But that's how God works in pictures and types, parables. You know what's given to us to understand the parables, so to speak, to understand the pictures. If you'll read your Bible, you'll be shocked at how many pictures are in there. Now you could, and listen, there are so many more. This is just some of my favorite ones. It, it matches Revelation 8, 6. The seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. John is a picture of the pre-tribulation rapture. In chapters 1 through 3, you've got church, 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 church. All those verses in there that are up on the board mention church. In Revelation 8 through 11, you have the seven angels sounding the seven trumpets. Now what, in 4-1, so you have church in chapters 1, 2, and 3, repeatedly. 4-1, after this I looked. Behold, a door was opened to heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet calling, uh, talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was sat in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So the Bible says, Come up hither. John is a picture of the rapture of the church. He is a picture. The rapture isn't going on in Revelation 4.1. It is a picture, just like chapters 1 through 3 are a picture of all time. Laodicean age, the last, uh, um, last church age, last period there. And if you study your Bible, what do you have in 1 Thessalonians? Picture, you have the rapture. What's 2 Thessalonians? Second coming talks about that. What's the book before 1 and 2 Thessalonians? Colossians. What do you have in Colossians? Laodicea is mentioned five times. So you have Laodicea in Colossians, rapture in 1 Thessalonians, second coming in 2 Thessalonians. <laughs> it's just that's the way your Bible's laid out and God keeps repeating it and beating us over the head with it and says, wake up, quit trying to twist my scripture. But these guys want to go through the tribulation, so I say, have at it. But, but pray for me. They've, there's some things going on about a debate on it. And I'm praying about whether I should go down that alley. 
says, come up hither, I will show thee things which should be hereafter. So he says, I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. That's after Revelation 4.1. So what are, you know, when you look at the last trump, here are the trumpets that are mentioned in Revelation. What's the last trump? Well, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. By the way, even the wording, for the Lord himself. You remember in uh, Genesis 22, God shall provide what? Himself. Isn't that cool? Well, the Lord himself. So who's coming to get us? Who's coming to get the tribulation saints? He's going to send his angel. Who came to get Lot? The angel. It, it all fits together. And if you just let it fit together and don't twist it, it'll all make sense. So he says, with the trump of God. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Well, somebody says, well, the last trump's the seventh trumpet. Now, they make the, they make the rapture of the sixth, between the sixth and seventh trump, and then they say the last trump is actually the last trump of Revelation. Well, that's not, that's not the way it works. 1 Corinthians was penned around 59 A.D., while Revelation was penned around 96 A.D. So you think that Paul might have been talking about Revelation that hadn't been revealed yet as the last trump? Or is he talking about something in the Old Testament? Well, the trump of God refers to the final sound of the church age, i.e. the last trump. And Paul refers back to something in the Old Testament. It's actually found in Numbers chapter 10 as a picture and a type. The use of the trumpets, there's two silver trumpets in, in uh, Numbers chapter 10. They're an ordinance, verse 8, a memorial, verse 10. Well, the first usage of the trumpets was for the calling of the assembly, verses 3 and 4 and 7. That's the last trump. You'll see this in a moment. I'll put the verses up here. Additional sounds were for the journeying of the camps with the sounding of alarms, verses 5 and 6. So let's look at this thing. Numbers 10, 3. Here is the assembling together. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Sounds a little bit like an assembly. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. How many trumpets are there? Two. What's this? This is the last trump, unless more follow. What's going to happen? There's going to be a last trump of the church age, but more will follow later. Let's just see what it says. That's verses 3 and 4. Now look at 5 and through 7. But when you blow an alarm, now this is more trumps after the, if the assembly, if they keep blowing an alarm, I mean they keep blowing the trumps, that means there's an alarm. When you blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east part shall go forward. When you blow an alarm the second time, then the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. But look at verse 7. But when the congregation is to be gathered together, you shall blow... The last trump, but you shall not sound an alarm. Here's the key. And it's this simple. Numbers chapter 10 shows us the two trumpets. If you want the, the assembling together, you blow, and that's the last trump. And then if there's an alarm, more trumpet sounds follow. So what you're going to have is the last trump of the church age, Numbers chapter 10, verse 3, 4, and 7... And then in Revelation for the alarms, because ours isn't an alarm, ours is a triumph. Ours is a gathering together. And then you're going to have more trumpets, the seven trumpets that will sound. Um, I think I can go through this in, in a couple of minutes. i got about three minutes left. Revelation 119, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Here's Revelation rightly divided. Three parts, past, things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Well, when you look at this thing, when you write the things which thou hast seen, he defines this in verse 20. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars of the angel of the seven churches, seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So people get confused. Well, wait a minute, it's written in chapter 1, so you can't talk about chapter 1, 2, and 3 as something he's already seen. But in fact, you can because verse 20 defines it and says, the church age is what thou sawest. So in 4, 1, what's past? The church age. That's why you have the rapture in 4, 1. 
Does everybody see that? Because that's, I can't, you know, I just, you got to get that. So John expounds upon what he saw in chapters 2 and 3 as he writes about the entire church age in picture and type. John then personally serves the picture of the rapture of the church in 4.1. He starts chapter 4 with a phrase that further indicates timing. After this, isn't God good? All four of you agree. Isn't God good? I'm kidding. After this, the church age, I looked and behold a door was opened in heaven and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which, which must be hereafter. So 119 talks about things that shall be hereafter. So where's the present? Well, in 4 1, it's the picture of the rapture. That's the present. You see kings and priests in heaven. They have, you know, they have crowns. They have uh, the attire of a, of a priest. So what do you have? Judgment seat of Christ has taken place. How can you have crowns if nobody's been judged? So Revelation 119, write the things which thou hast seen. What are the things which thou hast seen? Well, that's the past. That's the church age. Revelation 1 through 3. Chapter 4, verse 1 is a picture of the rapture of the church. That's the present. There's a throne in heaven. You have the judgment set there. And then the things which shall be hereafter, that's the future. You have the tribulation, chapters 5 through 19. The church is never mentioned there. Revelation 19, 4, the second coming. And then you have the millennium and eternity. That's Revelation chapters 20 through 22. I know that's rather fast, but I, I'm, I, I do it this way. I tell people, I say, look, I want to overwhelm you. I don't expect you to write notes, get it all, but you get enough to go, hey, I think he may have presented the case of a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And that's all I want to do here. Uh, we talk about the ambassadors there, but it is 1045, and I am going to stop there. And um, I appreciate the opportunity. I better save it, huh? Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to, to uh, preach this morning, or to teach, actually, and... Um, just pray for us. I ask you to do that. I mean, the most important thing you can do for my ministry is pray. And the biggest thing you can pray for is that I don't get off track. Sometimes you get attacked, you want to fight back. And I haven't gotten attacked for a while other than, you know, by Satan in my, in my mind when I'm preaching. You know, you get that all the time. You'd be surprised. You know, you know what you could do while preachers are preaching? Pray for them. And put a smile on your face. I mean, you guys are fine. You guys are a great, great, great group. But put a smile on your face. Nod your head. Say, hey, amen. I agree. You want to know why? You're telling that preacher that he's on track. Now, if he gets off track, then do what people normally do. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. You've been, you've been great, but I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, I was fortunate. I started in nursing homes, prisons, jails, rescue missions. I didn't preach but a couple of times in a church, first 10 years I preached, probably the best thing that ever happened for me because that was where the glory was. And God had me cut my teeth when they had to wheel him in in the nursing home. They locked him up in a jail and then you had juvenile detention. I mean, you know, that's where I preached for 10 years. Probably the greatest training ground uh, that you could ever have. And uh, God has blessed me beyond um, just what I can even express. So I would appreciate your prayers. And then we'll go ahead and be dismissed and start in the morning service. Lord, you thank you for many blessings. Thank you for sending your son to die for our sins. I just pray you'd, uh, Lord, just preach through Brother Sal. Lord, give him the message that you would have each one of us to hear. Open up our ears, open up our hearts, open up our minds, and help us to receive thy word in the spirit in which you would have us to receive it. And Lord, just... Guide, lead, and direct in all things. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen.